So history bounding, dressing in historical styles to greater or lesser degrees in everyday life. And because it derives from Disney bounding, which was born out of being creative with clothing restrictions, it makes sense that history bounding is strongly linked to clothing as well. But maybe it's just me, but I really feel like history bounding as a term and as a concept has really expanded its scope to include all manner of things beyond clothes. To me, at least, it has become something closer to a feeling of playful time travel rather than a style or specific sartorial choice. I talked a lot in my previous video about how I express my personality and my clothing choices, but that's not how everyone does it. And even if they do, it's unlikely to be the only way they express themselves. There are so many ways people outwardly experience their lives and express themselves. Can any of those other things be made to history bound? I say yes. To me, history bounding is a feeling of time travel, evoked by material culture in general, not just clothing. Allow me to expound. One of my favorite quirks of language is the really intense link between our mental and physical experiences. In many languages, words can be used to express both of these things. Feel and sense in English, for instance, both pull double duty. You can feel sad, you can also feel something soft. You can get the sense that someone isn't having fun right now, but you also have physical senses like proprioception and touch. Some examples from other languages include um, in French, there's sentir, in Hindi, there is mesuskena, in Arabic, there is shaur, in Japanese, kanjiru, in Welsh, there is sunmir. The nuance of language being what it is, some of these words are used more in one context than another, but I did my best to find examples that were used to refer both to physical senses and psychological or emotional senses, at least some of the time. When we experience a strong emotion, it has a physical response sometimes. An ache in the heart, a flutter in the stomach, a pain in the eyes. One of the things that people will talk about a lot regarding the world of vintage clothing and sewing historical clothing is how much the object itself creates a feeling. The feeling of knowing or understanding, or something bigger like continuity. It gives one a feeling of solidarity, almost of continuity with the past, that sort of thing. We are a species of consummate physicality. To touch a thing is tantamount to knowing it. And we like to know. This is why, despite all common sense dictating otherwise, fully grown adults still need signs in museums that say, please don't touch the exhibits. In the words of the late great Terry Pratchett, some humans would do anything to see if it was possible to do it. If you put a large switch in some cave somewhere with a sign on it saying, end of the world switch, please do not touch, the paint wouldn't even have time to dry. This is the foundation for material culture as a study. And just to clarify, I don't mean consumerism or materialism. I mean the study, examination, and attempt to understand culture, our own or others, based on the physical material and items left behind. We are all participating in a kind of casual experimental archeology span slash anthropology in this community when we recreate garments. This is why I put it to you that we cannot disregard objects and images that are not clothing when we talk about this weird and wonderful community we have here even if costume and clothing is our main unifying theme. So let's talk about some ways we can experience history bounding and history with the non-clothing parts of our lives. I'm going to divide this video into a few different categories and offer some examples of each, but this is not a comprehensive list, and I'm sure there are so many things I will miss out on. So use this as a jumping off point to start thinking about it in your own life. I'll be exploring this in the context of objects and things, even if some of them only ever exist for you on a computer screen, that's okay. The experience of a lot of these things needn't be paired with ownership of these things. So put your wallet away if you're not interested in owning this stuff. Enjoyment of them at a distance can still get you that far away time feeling. So let's go. Whether you're making it, buying it, or finding images from the internet to enjoy, art is a great opportunity to get that feeling of history. Some different ways to explore it are the following. Option one, actual historical artworks, or if you're not a gazillionaire, replicas and copies. When I was in university, there was a poster company that came once per year and held a massive poster sale on campus. I bought posters at various times at those sales that were replicas of famous works of art. If you don't want to buy the physical replicas, you can create historically themed Pinterest boards or use the Rijksmuseum Gallery. This is a tool from the Rijksmuseum which allows you to collect your favorite exhibits from the museum into a little personal gallery, and you can also explore other people's curations if they're public. Link in the description. Option two is art or artists that evoke the past in their works. 
There are a bunch of different ways, I'm sure, of how you can approach this kind of artistic history bounding, but let me suggest two artists to you in particular, who, while very different, both create magnificent art that is as much about the present as the past. Ron Hicks is an artist I came across a few years ago when I saw this image, and thought I was looking at an impressionist painting from the turn of the century. I clicked on it and was taken to Ron Hicks' Instagram page and found out that he was the artist. That feeling I got from that painting, it's it's the feeling of not exactly the past. There's nothing to place these paintings in time, so they're as strikingly modern as they are historical. Ron Hicks has done a lot of work, and along with these more historically inspired works, his most recent series of portraits help him tell stories about his experiences coming up in his career as a black artist in Colorado. I'll link some articles as well as his website and Instagram down below. Fred Wilson is another artist who calls the past to mind with art, but in a very different way. His most famous exhibition was called Mining the Museum. I'm going to fail spectacularly at describing it myself, so please allow me to quote from sections of the Wikipedia page. The title of the exhibition refers to how Wilson extracted and unearthed objects from the Maryland Historical Society collections. The purpose of the exhibition was to address the biases museums have, often omitting or underrepresenting oppressed peoples and focusing on prominent white men. Wilson took items from the existing museum's collection and reshuffled them to highlight the history of African American and Native American Marylanders. This reassembly created a new viewpoint of colonization, slavery, and abolition through the use of satire and irony. Wilson juxtaposed historically important artifacts with each other to address the injustices in history and the injustices of not being properly exhibited. The entrance of the exhibition displayed three busts of important individuals, Napoleon, Andrew Jackson, and Henry Clay. These were displayed on pedestals. To the left of these busts were empty black pedestals with the names of three important, overlooked African-American Marylanders, Frederick Douglass, Benjamin Banneker, and Harriet Tubman. Wilson extracted paintings from the 18th century and 19th century featuring African-Americans from the museum collection. Within this collection, Wilson renamed the paintings in order to shift the focus towards African-Americans featured in them. One of the oil paintings, titled Country Life, was renamed Frederick Serving Fruit in order to emphasize and underline the young African-American who was depicted serving the white people in the picture. Fred Wilson represented the United States in the 2003 Venice Biennale and presented a series of works as a reworking of Shakespeare's Othello. It consisted of various objects, such as mirrors and chandeliers, that were used to comment on the text. These objects are made of black Murano glass, which indicated how Wilson has transferred the context of Othello into a world where race is not ignored and is instead a crucial central focus. These two artists both use the past in their art, but make it in very different ways. They are both extraordinary, and I urge you to check them out. The next category is music. In the context of music, here are a few options for experiencing it in a historical perspective. Original format. Sheet music. Before there were music players, there was sheet music and concerts. In cities with good public library systems, you will usually find sheet music available, and some libraries even have musical instrument rentals. Perhaps you can try and gain some accomplishments, as would befit a young Regency lady. But all young ladies are accomplished. They sing, they draw, they dance, speak French and German, cover screens, and I know not what. If you're listening to music from the 20s and 30s, try to find some old records from the time. Uh, these, for instance, are records that I rescued from a charity shop that didn't have any sleeves or anything. <laughs> Listening to music in a contemporary format, streaming them online, for instance, is a great way to be able to explore a huge amount of historical music. The entire world is at your fingertips if you have access to streaming online. Or this is a bit of a specific one, but I think you all might like it. There was a series of educational classical music CDs which were developed to teach children about famous classical composers. I was obsessed with these CDs when I was a kid, and I maintain that a great deal of my current love for music and storytelling came from these productions. My favorites are Mr. Bach Comes to Call, Tchaikovsky Discovers America, and Vivaldi's Ring of Mystery. Probably the most famous and the one that most people will have heard of is Beethoven Lives Upstairs. Option two is to listen to contemporary music in an old-fashioned style. Most common styles of music in this category tend to be jazz, rockabilly-styled rock and roll, bluegrass, and folk. Some really good contemporary examples are people like Dandy Wellington, who heads up a jazz-age band. 
The Fratelli's first studio album was a decidedly rockabilly style, and along with these examples, your local jazz or folk music festival will be rife with bands who have styles that reflect all kinds of musical history, so you should check them out. This might surprise you, but there's more to this than just find antique cookbooks. Although that is step one of category one. Antique cookbooks are an amazing insight into history and food culture around the world, but very much like antique sewing manuals, there's an element of decrypting that has to take place. The phrase, the usual way, or a usual amount, will come up here too. Along with the antique cookbooks, try to do a little bit of research to help understand the time and the culture a little bit better. This will not only help you read the recipes, but also give you some really great insights into the daily lives of people who would be eating these foods. If you're a bit stuck on places to start with this, there are some well-known cookery books and cookery book writers that you can probably get a good start with. The Form of Curry from the 14th century, The Accomplished Cook by Robert May in the 17th century, Fanny Farmer, Eliza Acton, and Mrs. Beaton were all 19th century recipe writers, Fanny Farmer being famous for establishing the standardized measurement that is included in most cookbooks nowadays. Or, if you're not in the least interested in a cuisine that was derided for its blandness for several hundred years, there's a link in the description to a list of the oldest cookbooks ever discovered, which actually comprehend a much wider range of cuisines from around the world. You can also check out Tasting History with Max Miller, who's a delight and does some truly excellent culinary time travel. The second option is kind of an adaptation from the first, but a lot easier for those of you who don't have the time or indeed the inclination to get elbow deep in the wild world of manuscript translation. This option is to get modern cookbooks of collected historical recipes. A lot of the research will be included within the pages, which also usually provides a great jumping off point for research of your own. Also, these books usually have rewritten the recipe to accommodate contemporary ovens, ingredient availability, or standardized measurements, and make them, you know, legible. These books are also usually collected around a theme. One of my favorites in this category is Recipes for Victory, a collection of recipes from the time of World War I in Canada and from Canadians on the front. They are transcribed in their original format and then rewritten in a modern way for clarity. Best hot chocolate recipe ever, by the way, in this book. This is by far one of the most common and popular ways that people explore history outside of the realm of history nerds. So I won't be spending basically any time on it, except to say that leaving it out would have felt a little bit wrong. If you need an example of how people in the 21st century can history bound their interior design, just Google the term mid-century modern and you'll know what I mean. But for the sake of actually being a sport about this, here's a really short guide. Go to my video on history bounding for beginners, and whenever I say clothes, Replace that in your mind with furniture, decor, or fixtures. There, you're all set. Go have fun. Really quick, if you missed it in last week's video, I will be hosting a live stream Q&A on the 22nd of May. I'll be taking questions from the comments of last week's video and this video, as well as in my stories on Instagram. If time permits, I'll also be answering questions that are posed in the chat. Info about the time of the live stream will be available on the screen now. During that live stream, I will also announce some slight changes to the schedule of this channel and announce a new project that I'm going to need your help with. I hope to see you there. My Patreon followers got an advance announcement of this in a private live stream a few weeks ago. If you want to support me and get first crack at any of the upcoming projects and plans that I have going on, check the link in the description. And now what I have been waiting this whole video to talk about. I was going to divide these into two categories at first, but as I wrote them out, I found that they shared so much, especially as we moved through the 20th century, so I couldn't rightly divide them. When I use the words author or book, please replace it with your noun or pronoun of choice, depending on the media in question. Once again, we have a whole bunch of options here, and I could talk about them forever. But here are some basic genres that evoke history in one way or another. Also, I'm not including nonfiction in this video because that's a whole can of worms that I just do not have the time to unpack. So option one is period literature. For our purposes, this is media where the plot occurs wholly or mostly in the time period in which it was written. This kind of media evokes the past for us by virtue of having been written then. 
you were reading something that would have been read by people of that time about their own time. It's sometimes harder to understand or read because some of the words, ideas, or behaviors have not lasted through to the present day, and that's okay. It gives us an opportunity to learn. I get such a lovely feeling of time travel from these novels because the author doesn't know that I'm not from that time. It feels like I'm being given this little window into that time and place. Unfortunately, along with total immersion comes total immersion. This genre is definitely the most likely to contain extremely not cool language ideas and behaviors, so keep a critical eye out for it. It doesn't need to ruin your experience of the book, but it's still something that should be examined. These movies and books are artifacts, and they likely communicate something very different to us than the people who experienced them when they were new. To me, that is a really interesting thought to explore. My favorite bookish examples are Persuasion by Jane Austen, The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu, and Reuben Sachs by Amy Levy. My favorite movie examples are The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night. You can be replaced, Chicky Baby. I don't care. That pose is on too, Sunny Jim. The new thing is to care passionately and be right wing. I lose this Susan when she's at home. Only Susan can't be our resident teenager. You'll have to love her. She's your symbol. Oh, you mean that posh bird who gets everything wrong? Get him out of here. Have I said something amiss? Get him out of here. He's knocking the program to you, Chuck. You don't think he's a new phenomenon, do you? You mean an early clue to the new direction? Where's the calendar? I remember. It's all right. He's just a troublemaker. The change isn't due for three weeks yet. Twelve angry men. Why, oh, I hate these men. Did you ever see a knife fight? You? No. Anybody here ever see a knife fight? No, oh, I have. Switchblades came with the neighborhood where I live. Funny, I never thought of it before. I guess you try to forget those things. And all the president's men. Option two is historical fiction. For our purposes, this is literature that is set in a time before living memory of either the audience or the author. If the media was created during your lifetime, there's a good chance that it's written in a style or with a perspective that you either share or at least understand. It's also probably written in language that's largely familiar to you. And if it isn't, you're furnished with context clues that help because the author is familiar with public knowledge and can provide necessary context without pulling you entirely out of the story. The magic of this genre, though, is the possibility for several layers of historical immersion. For example, if you read War and Peace, you are reading a book that is written in the 1860s, but is set in 1805, 23 years before the birth of Leo Tolstoy. If you're reading it in 2021, you're not reading a historical fiction book that was written with you in mind. It was written as historical fiction for 19th century Europeans. So the helpful context clues that might exist or the cheeky nods to looming historical events might not be so helpful or understandable to you. But this is a magnificent opportunity to see history how people from later history would have perceived it. One of my personal favorite books of historical fiction is a book called A Suitable Boy. It is a sprawling family epic set in post-independence India. The insight that this book is able to provide to a world that is materially different from my own in terms of time, geography, and culture is astounding. Also, having been published in 1993, 20 years removed from the most recent armed conflict with Pakistan up until that point, I imagine that the text would read very differently for Indians even six years later when the Kargil War broke out in 1999. As for film examples, while there's surely no dearth of period drama films being made these days, I'd say that an especially interesting experiment when looking from a historical lens is movies that are very old for you, but were period dramas even at the time that they were made. Two of my favorites are Some Like It Hot, starring Marilyn Monroe, made in 1959 and set in 1929. Catching cold all the time, huh? Will you quit stalling? We're gonna miss the train. I feel naked. I feel like everybody's staring at me. With those legs, are you crazy? Now, come on. And Cyrano de Bergerac, starring Jose Ferrer. This is an especially fun time portal, as it is made in 1950, adapted from an 1897 play, which is itself set in the 17th century. <laughs> Oh, young sir, you're too simple. Why, you might have said a great many things. 
Why waste your opportunity? For example, thus. Practical. How do you drink with such a nose? You must have had a cup made especially. Descriptive. Tis a rock, a crag, a cape. A cape? Say rather a peninsula. Kindly. Ah, do you love the little birds so much that when they come and sing to you, you give them this to perch on? Enterprising. But a sign for some perfumer. Respectful. Uh, sir, I recognize in you a man of parts, a man of um, prominence. Or literary. Was this the nose that launched a thousand ships? These, my dear sir, are things you might have said had you some tinge of letters or of wit to color your discourse. And of letters, you need but three to write you down. A. S. 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 Yeah, that. Take that away with you and just think about it. Option three, the pastiche. Okay, so this one is a little bit different, but it's my personal favorite. We're going to spend some time on it. A pastiche is a work that imitates the work of another artist or genre. In the context of this video, we're talking about books or films that technically fit into the historical fiction genre, but are created to deliberately produce the effect or feeling of period literature. So essentially to make you forget that what you're watching or reading is newer than the period it depicts. Movies do this a little bit differently than books, but it produces a very similar effect on the whole, so I'm keeping them together again. In the case of a book, it will be written to emulate the style of writing of the period as closely as possible. Oftentimes there will be a framing device to better sell this illusion. Two of my absolute favorite book examples are Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clarke. This book is a fantasy novel published in 2004, but written in the form of an annotated historical account of the events leading to the restoration of magic to England around the time of the Regency after a long absence of real magic. Along with a very compelling story written in the style of Regency novels, there are academic style footnotes and references to historical manuscripts and primary texts which don't exist. But the book is written as though the reader would be familiar with the references and the events described. This is where this pastiche style differs from historical fiction. The author is trying to hide the contemporary nature of the work and keep you in that feeling of time travel. My other favorite of this type is The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, which is an extraordinary authorial feat. The framing device that is used is that the person publishing the work came across the manuscript, which was a personal account of a 14th century monk. But the manuscript is no longer in his possession after a rough breakup, and so he has to rely on a copy of his notes and his memory of the work, which was only a rough translation to begin with, to recreate it in a contemporary translation. We are therefore taken into a world where we are simultaneously made aware of the fact that certain liberties might have been taken, but otherwise we are relying on the fact that this is an actual account of a 14th century monk. Like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, after the note at the beginning of the novel which sets up the framing device, no mention or allusion to the contemporary world is made by the author or narrator, and the context clues to help out the contemporary reader are buried deep. This kind of literary time travel is my favorite of the categories I've mentioned so far, because it is much harder to do well, as it requires a very robust amount of world building and historical knowledge, even in the context of a fantasy, which makes it a pleasure for a history nerd to read when it is pulled off. Movies, and to a lesser extent TV shows by necessity, usually have to do this a little bit differently. It's really hard to sell the illusion of history in a film setting because the look of film has changed in that time. One of the crucial things that ends up separating the pastiche style of historical films from regular historical dramas is how the past is presented to you, the modern audience. One of the ways that I am guaranteed to love a period drama in film or television is if I find myself forgetting altogether that it is set in the past. The filmmaker makes a conscious effort not to draw your attention to it. Rather than sending little winks and nudges to the audience about how different that time was to us, or using the actors as showcases for elaborate or visually overwhelming costumes, the time setting instead becomes a matter of course so much so that it fades into the background entirely. A great example of this in films is the magnificent country house murder mystery Gosford Park, which is set in November of 1932. Don't, 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 please don't. 
One of the strokes of genius of the screenplay is that the plot and events play off the murder mystery genre in a way that was popular for murder mysteries at the time. Even though I haven't seen more than one episode of each, I'm also compelled to guess that both The Pen15 Club and Stranger Things would fit in this category. I am reliably informed that there are long sections of both of these shows where it is possible to forget that you are watching a period piece. So if I had seen them, those might also be on my list. <laughs> When it comes to history bounding, no matter what you are watching, reading, making, or appreciating, we're all looking for a feeling. It's different for everyone, and so I can only make the barest of suggestions for you. If history interests you, it's up to you to find ways to bring it into your life. But I hope that these suggestions have been helpful and enriching for you, and that they will help you in big or small ways to live a life that is more historical. Almost any aspect in our material culture, I'm convinced, can be engaged with from a historical angle. But there are some things that I didn't mention because I don't have sufficient ideas or examples for you. But here are some more examples if you want to look into them. Gardening or landscaping, theater and performing arts, other arts and crafts besides sewing. Check out McNerdy Costumes for some really cool stuff that she's been doing with woodworking. Automobiles or machinery. Go for it. Thank you so much for watching. Happy history bounding, and I'll see you soon.